Hello again, and happy Sunday from Metro Manila, the Philippines, Southeastern Asia. This will be my last installment for the time being in English into the series on the young murderers. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, who became international celebrities posthumous on April the 20th, 1999, after opening fire on tens of fellow students, uh, injuring one teacher, an art teacher, and then fatally wounding another teacher who taught computer science and business subjects and was a sports. The venue was Columbine High School near Littleton in the Denver metropolitan area of Colorado in western United States. In the 21 years that have passed since the Columbine High School massacre, there have been various alternative explanations of why these outwardly bright and <clears throat> successful students, who generally speaking had, as far as the classroom behavior was concerned, a fairly clean record. Dylan had been suspended for a few days for having uh, uh, written a threatening message uh, on the walker of a boy. Uh, who was apparently dating the girl in whom Dylan had been romantically interested. And in her book, uh, A Mother's Reckoning, Dylan's mother, Sue Klebold, she has kept her married name despite the fact that uh, years ago her husband Tom unfortunately divorced her. One of the factors was that since their son, their younger son, happened to be one of the two murderers, at Columbine High School, they got intense media attention, and uh, Sue Klebold, having worked as a uh, worked as a teacher and also as uh, the personal assistant of uh, personal assistant of various disabled students, was much better equipped emotionally to handle that pressure than the much more introverted Tom. Well, one explanation could be the increasing alienation of the Western societies, including the United States, from the uh, Christian moral values. For example, that people should not repay evil with evil, but rather should try to overcome evil with good. People should try to be merciful, should try to treat others the way they wish to be treated by them. Um, the irony is that out of the Western countries, by the Western countries, I mean Canada, the United States, the Europe on a per capita basis. The United States has the largest number of Christian congregations and fellowships, including house fellowships, probably the largest number of Christian movements and denominations, and probably, at least on absolute terms, the largest number of Christian radio stations, Christian Christian podcasts or broadcasts on the internet and also Christian television channels. So, in a digital sense at least, there seems to be little shortage of the gospel being preached. Whether Americans as a whole are turning to the Lord, even amid the, these tragic events like the current coronavirus pandemic, that's another matter. But this has been repeated throughout history. I mean, Officially, Europe used to be a very Christian continent. In almost every European country, the state church was officially a Christian church, whether it was the Roman Catholic Church, like in Western and partly Central and um, Southeastern and especially Southern Europe, the Orthodox Church, as in most of Eastern Europe, the Lutheran Church in the Nordic Scandinavia, where I'm from, more specifically from Finland, the Anglican and Presbyterian churches in Britain, and when Ireland still belonged to Britain in Ireland as well, and after that the Roman Catholic Church, although it's no longer the state church. So officially, Europe was very Christian, however, in practice, even then, most Europeans were not Christians by the biblical standards. Canada used to be officially a very Christian country, but now it's an increasingly secularized country. And contrary to the United States, uh, it is a more 
should I say, consistently secularized country. While there is a Christian right uh, on the fringes of Canadian politics, uh, it is a lot smaller one than in the United States, a lot less prominent in the mass media and in education, a lot less successful, and it seems also a lot less uh, loud and courageous. So there are these issues of various kinds. Um, one explanation, of course, could be violence in the mass media. The internet was already commonly used in the United States in the late 1990s. And out of the two boys, Eric was an avid user of the internet and even kept um, a journal on his computer where he, for example, mocked those police officers uh, whom he and Dylan had been able to bluff into thinking that they were genuinely sorry for their uh, crime of uh, stealing some stereos and other digital equipment uh, from a van that had been parked uh, near the home of one of them. And um, a certain, should I say, extreme fundamentalist Christians, the ones who believe that the uh, Bible's creation account uh, must be interpreted as God having literally created the world in six 24-hour uh, days, and any form of evolution, even the Christianized form of secular evolution called the so-called theistic evolution, the belief that God, yes, did create the world, but he used evolution as his tool, um, invites people supposedly to these attacks. Um, there is a grain of truth in this explanation, although it's mostly false. Uh, Dylan didn't seem to care much about the evolutionary theory. Eric used it and manipulated it. Because Eric, uh, for example, in his private journal, uh, justified his and Dylan's theft of that stereo equipment by natural selection. And Eric even boasted in his private journal that Eric and his friend Dylan had become supposedly superhuman. And then supposedly they had the right then to terminate the physical lives of various people whom they considered inferior. They spent a great deal of time uh, building propane bombs, and unfortunately their, all of their parents were oblivious to what their sons were doing. They spent time even practicing shooting in a nearby forest, and there is still a video footage left, I've seen it on YouTube, uh, where one of them shoots and the other one, using a swear word, if I remember correctly, uh, cheers him on. And then there were those so-called basement tapes, videotapes that were made by the boys. The last one was made on the morning of the attack. Uh, after being reviewed by the police officer and after being transcripted, uh, they have been destroyed. I have read, if I remember correctly, one transcript. I've also read one transcript uh, online of Eric's diary, and I must say that I was appalled. I was so deeply sad, and Eric was such a bright boy and young man. He had already turned 18, so he was legally an adult. Uh, legally, he could buy guns, while uh, Dylan was still some or several months shy of his 18th birthday. Um, Eric had applied uh, to join the U.S. Army, but because of his... Uh, need to use depressants, antidepressants, he was rejected. Dylan had already applied and been applied to and been accepted by three universities and he had even visited at least one of them. And in the prom, senior prom dance that took place only a few weeks before the shooting, or only a few days actually before the shootings, they both seemed to enjoy, especially Dylan seemed to enjoy his time. In his farewell message, uh, while apologizing for his actions, Dylan said that he never enjoyed life much and he would be happy wherever expletive deleted uh, he was going. Uh, since his uh, family is part of Jewish heritage, yes, they attended a Lutheran church, but they also observed some Jewish uh, customs. And actually, a few weeks before the attack, uh, 
Dylan, again, using an expletive, uh, referred to his parents attending the Jewish Passover meal, ceremonial meal, Seder. Uh, Dylan, sorry, Dylan, not Eric. Um, was there some bullying of the two boys? Yes, but that's sadly common. Despite the efforts of both teachers, uh, non-teaching faculty members and students, including those who are peer counselors and peer mediators, to root it out. Satan, uh, satanic or satanist music of uh, pop and rock singer Marilyn Manson, and actually um, Misty Bernal, uh, who is the mother of Cassie Bernal, one of the most prominent victims of the massacre, um, quoted one expletive laden song uh, and uh, like nihilistic uh, bleakly despairing song by Marilyn Manson in her daughter's short biography she said yes the unlikely martyrdom of Cassie Bernal in one explanation offered by various Christian uh, pastors evangelists other ministers of the gospel uh, journalists and even lay Christians was that the boys actually hated uh, those of their fellow students who were professing born-again Christians, including especially Cassie. I'm sorry, not Cassie, because Cassie did not witness so openly about Jesus Christ. Uh, but Rachel Scott, who indeed kept a journal, and just over, just under a year before the shootings on May the second, 1998, according to her father. Um, Daryl Scott, if I remember correctly, um, she had written in her private diary, this will be my last year, Lord. Uh, I've gotten what I can. Thank you. And she even drew, I think, during one visual arts lesson, um, two eyes and then was it 13 teardrops running from those eyes to a flower. And indeed, I think that's the cover photograph of um, her biography, Rachel's Tears, written by her mother, I think. Despite the fact that her father, at least, has been a pastor, a preacher, an evangelist, uh, he and uh, Rachel's mother, Beth Nimmo, tragically got divorced in the late 1980s, although they remained friends. And indeed, uh, Beth Nimmo was one of the first people, if not the first pe person, to contact Daryl Scott on that fateful day. And Craig Scott, uh, Rachel's brother, with whom uh, she had had an argument because of his tardiness or something like that, uh, was able to escape uh, the library where actually most of the um, 13 victims of the boys were killed. Another escapee was Crystal Woodman, who is now Woodman Miller, who is a popular Christian promotional speaker and writer. Um, since the two boys, murderous boys, Eric and Dylan, wore trench coats um, on the day of the massacre, uh, there was talk of some kind of trench coat mafia being behind it, but it seems, after careful investigations by the police and by a journalist called Dave Cullen, that there was no wider conspiracy. The two boys themselves were involved, especially Eric. And Eric's private journal, based on the sample of it, not only was it filled with expletives, in other words, uh, swear words, but uh, filled with expletives of hatred and contempt towards the society and towards the humanity in general, except for those who are likable. Interestingly enough, um, some 15 months before the massacre, in January 1998, he had posted on his website a uh, threat uh, which read something like this. I don't care if I live or die in the shootout. I just want to kill as many of you beep as possible, especially a few people like Brooks Brown. Brooks Brown was a schoolmate of Eric and Dylan, and for some reason or reasons, Eric and Brooks uh, had had an argument or arguments, and Eric had come to hate Brooks. However, some or several months after, the threat was posted, and the threat actually had alerted Brooks' parents uh, to make a complaint to the local police. Sadly, that report 
was somehow misplaced and not acted on in time. So there have been those who have played, uh, I mean, blamed the local police or certain specific local police officers for not having taken Eric's murderous threats online seriously. Of course, after all these massacres, copyright copycat massacres and so forth, virtually any threat, whether it's verbal, digital or written, or like a <laughs> banner threat, is a potential death threat that should be taken seriously enough by parents, guardians, educators, police officers, pastors, other religious leaders, and so forth. Youth groups. Um, interestingly enough, later in 1998, Eric and Brooks reconciled, and indeed on the morning of that fateful day, just before the massacre began, Brooks, who had himself... Uh, skipped or been unauthorizedly absent from one morning lesson and had been concerned about the fact that Eric had missed so far all of the morning lessons, including one where there was a test, I think, in psychology. And usually Eric took great care to be present, especially on the test and exam days. And when uh, Brooks met Eric on the parking, one of the school's parking lots, or the only one, I can't remember if it was the only one or not, uh, he asked Eric, what are you doing? And then commented, uh, you missed the test. Uh, mockingly, Eric replied, it doesn't matter anymore. And then he continued, Brooks, I like you now. Get out of here. Go home. And after hesitating uh, for a short time, Brooks did walk away from the uh, parking lot and from the school grounds. And yes, he did contact the police when he found a phone booth. And then I think he went to a friend's phone. Okay, after this very lengthy introduction, let's get uh, to Eric Harris's and Dylan Klebold's biography on murderpedia.org. So, the victims were the following, the ones who were actually killed. Their names and ages. Yeah, um, Eric Harris had been born on April the 9th, 1981. So just 11 days before the massacre, he had celebrated his 18th and last birthday. Actually, he had left a message on one of the chat rooms where he was a regular visitor. Um, and this comes from the Paris Match uh, French a weekly magazine, which I bought, by the way, shocked by this tragedy uh, back in April or May 1999. Uh, this is my last day on the earth. So Rachel Scott was 17. Daniel Rorbo was 15. William David Sanders, who was that uh, computer science and business teacher and sports coach, who actually alerted the students in the commons, meaning the school's cafeteria, and uh, organized uh, the cafeteria's evacuation. If he had not been so vigilant, probably at least tens more students would have been killed. Actually, uh, towards the end of the massacre, the two boys seemed frustrated because they were killing a lot fewer people than they hoped to kill. And much to especially Eric's anger and frustration, the propane bombs that they had prepared did not go off. Because had they gone off, at least tens more, probably even hundreds more uh, students, and then several, if not tens more teachers, would have been killed. And they had strategically timed the attack to start between 11 a.m. and 12 noon, when they knew that the commons, the school's cafeteria, would be uh, rather full of students because most of the students ate their school lunch there. There were a few who ate it outside, including Rachel Scott and Richard Costaldo. Rachel, tragically enough, was killed, whether by Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold. Uh, Richard was seriously injured, but survived. And according to Richard's testimony, which has then he'd been challenged by various journalists, for example, and even by some survivors, uh, just before executing 
if we could use that verb, Rachel, um, Eric had asked her, do you believe in God? And then in the dramatized uh, movie about her life, I Am Not Ashamed, which I watched at least a couple of times, if not more times here on YouTube, um, the dialogue was like this, or the events went like this. Um, first, either Eric or Dylan or both shot towards Richard and um, Rachel, injuring probably both. Uh, Rachel was injured, I think, in one leg, and in uh, pain she sank on the lawn where she had gone to eat lunch with Richard because it was finally warm enough to eat lunch outside. And uh, mockingly, Eric then asked her, do you still believe in God? Despite her pain, um, Rachel answered firmly, you believe, you know I do. Eric cruelly replied, then go be with me. There was also another story, and it still be 21 years later quite prevalent in certain Christian circles, that uh, before shooting her fatally in the library, Eric Harris asked, Cassie Bernal, one of the two most prominent Christian victims, although there probably was at least one uh, other one, like John Tomlin, who was also active in his youth group, possibly also Isaiah Scholes, Isaiah Scholes, who was the only African-American student to be killed. Um, anyway, according to this story, which was actually based on Craig Scott's testimony, because he genuinely believed when giving that testimony that the girl was asked if she believed in God, was Cassie. But actually, later on, when he went back to the library of Columbine High School and was uh, there, asked to point to the desk from which he heard or under which he heard that voice, he actually pointed to the desk under which was hiding Valine Schnur, who admitted that she believed in God but survived, although with multiple uh, gunshot wounds. Yeah, anyway, this story was that um, the killer of uh, Cassie Bernal, probably Eric Harris, asked her, do you believe in God? After a moment's silence, and Cassie replied, yes. And then Eric put her at point-blank range. They, this once again goes to the side issues. The fact is that uh, the two boys deviated religion in general and Christianity in particular, and they had mocked Rachel for openly sharing he, her Christian testimony with them and for urging them to repent of their sins and commit their lives to Jesus Christ. So I cannot fully agree with Dave Cullen when uh, he has claimed that the boys did not have any particular students they wanted to kill. They just shot more or less at random. That is not fully true. If none of the uh, victims uh, was a pre-planned target, at least Rachel was, and Rachel indeed was the first one of the uh, victims to die. And actually one of the basement tapes the two boys loudly mocked Rachel and another Christian girl uh, they knew was studying at Columbine. And Rachel had actually attended a course about video filming with the two boys, and she had in no uncertain terms told them that she disliked their violent videos, uh, that their violence made her sick, because she preferred making uh, cool videos uh, with happy mu music. And also, at least Eric's one essay in an English course had so disturbed the teacher that I think um, he or she had even alerted his parents, but then Eric had lied that he was only joking. Interestingly enough, uh, Hung Sui Cho, uh, who was the perpetrator of the Virginia Tech massacre almost exactly eight years later on April the 16th, 2007, wrote disturbed, disturbing, yeah, violent, poetry and plays.
is so those can also be warning signs. And then Kyle Delasquez, who was a special needs uh, student, and because of his disabilities, he didn't really know what to do. He just uh, lowered his head. He didn't even try to hide under a desk. He was perhaps paralyzed by fear, and that was really tragic. He was 16. Stephen Kernel, 14. Cassie Bernal, 17. Isaiah Scholes, 18. And in Isaiah's final moments, uh, either Eric or Dylan used the N-word to taunt him racially. Matthew Kechter, 16. Warren Townsend, or Townsend, 18, John Tomlin, 16, Kelly Fleming, 16, Daniel Moser, 15. Daniel's uh, father has become a gun control active, uh, uh, advocate, by the way. And Corey DePooter, 17. So the killings took place or fatal shootings took place uh, between 11.10 and 11.59 a.m. local time. The tragedy, predictably enough, sparked national debates about school safety, although there had been high school killings earlier in the United States. And indeed, there had been two uh, within two months of each other in the fall semester of 1997. The FBI assisted local law enforcement by investigating additional threats and internet leads, conducting witness interviews and processing physical evidence. Dylan had been born on September the 11th, 1981. So had he lived still less than two and a half uh, more years, he would have celebrated his 20th birthday on September the 11th, 2001, the day of those terrorist attacks. I just wonder if the two boys would have cheered uh, the attacks or not. 24 others were injured, three of whom were injured as they escaped the attack. Ten of the 13 victims uh, were fatally shot in the library. Eric Harris had been born in Wichita, Kansas, the U.S. Midwest, uh, because Eric's father, Wayne Harris, was a U.S. Air Force transport pilot. The family moved often. His mother, Catherine Ann Poole, was a homemaker or housewife. The family moved from Plattsburgh, New York, to Littleton, Colorado in July 1993, so under six years before his shooting rampage, Wayne Harris then retired from military service. The Harris family lived in rented accommodations for the first three years in the Littleton area, and during this time, Eric and Dylan became friends. In 1996, the Harris family purchased a house south of Columbine High School. Eric's older brother, Kevin, attended college at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dylan Klebold was born to Thomas and Susan Klebold. His parents attended a Lutheran church with their children, and Dylan and his older brother, Byron, attended confirmation classes in accordance with the Lutheran tradition. Uh, at home, the family also observed some rituals in keeping with Klebold's maternal grandfather's Russian heritage. Klebold attended Normandy Elementary, Little to Colorado for the first two grades before transferring to Governor's Ranch Elementary. And then he attended Ken Carroll Middle School and eventually Columbine High School. Like his friend Dylan and his partner, uh, like his friend and partner in crime, Eric, Dylan was active in school play productions, operated video productions, and became computer assistants. Both of them maintaining the school's computer server. According to early accounts of the shooting, Harris and Klebold were allegedly very unpopular students and targets of bullying. While sources do support accounts of bullying directed towards them, accounts of them being outcasts have been reported to be false. Indeed, uh, Eric, according to some accounts uh, of his peers, seems to have been even somewhat of a ladies' man. Dylan seemed shyer, despite the fact that he was several inches taller than his partner in crime. Um, and he often uh, stood with his head down. Um, and he, according to one 
early analysis of uh, the pair needed a leader and founded found that leader in Eric. Like Eric went into much greater detail in developing his uh, misogynist, far-right, anti-humanity, um, and anti-social philosophy. Dylan seems to have been more of a follower. Uh, one of the reasons why Dylan didn't enjoy life was that he was unable to find a steady girlfriend. Harris and Klebold were initially reported to be members of a group that called themselves the Trenchcoat Mafia. Indeed, was it some weeks or months after the shooting, someone in uh, the Denver area saw a boy or a young man uh, wearing a sign on his T-shirt or a quote called, We are still ahead 13 to 2, referring to the 13 victims, uh, shot victims of the... Um, massacre and the two suicidal murderers. This detail is from Misty Bernal's book. Yeah, they had no particular connection with the group and did not appear in a group photo of the Trenchcoat Mafia in the 1998 Columbine yearbook. Harris and Klebold linked their personal computers on a network and both played many times over the internet. Harris created a set of levels for the game Doom, which later became known as the Harris Levels. Harris had a web presence under the handle Reb, short for Rebel, a nod to the nickname of Columbine's sports teams, and other cyber aliases, including Rebel Domacker, uh, or Rebel Doomacker, uh, Rebel Reb Doomer, and Reb Domain, while Klebold went by the names Vodka, or by the name Vodka. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, vodka with uh, capital D and capital K, and then vodka with capital D and small K, and then uh, capital A. Harris had various websites that hosted Doom and Quake files, as well as team information for those he gamed with online. The sites openly espoused hatred for the people of their neighborhood and the world in general. When the pair began experimenting with pipe bombs, they bo posted results of the explosions on the websites. The website was shut down by America Online after the shootings and was preserved for the FBI. In March 1998, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office investigator Michael Guerra looked at Harris's website after the parents of Brooks Brown, a fellow student, discovered Harris was making threats aimed at their son after a falling out between them. Guerra wrote a draft affidavit for a search warrant. Has tragically, the affidavit was never filed. If it had been filed and acted on this massacre, it possibly could have been either prevented in all, uh, uh, in total, or then at least would have taken place on a much smaller scale. Although uh, one consequence could have been that Harris and Klebold might have committed suicide because they were so suicidal and they hated life in general and certain people and communities in particular. They might even have committed suicide uh, in a youth uh, jail. This is my theory. Sorry if I'm wrong. This information was not revealed to the public until September 2001, so two and a half years, almost two and a half years after the shooting. And it's, though it was known by the police the entire time. In January 1998, Eric and Dylan were charged with mischief, breaking and entering, trespassing and theft. They both left uh, faking repentance, good impressions on the juvenile officers who offered to expunge their criminal records if they agreed to attend a diversionary program to include community service, received psychiatric treatment and obeyed the law. Harris was required to attend anger management classes where again he made a favorable imp impression and he later in his private journal mocked his um, diversionary officer for believing his lies. They were so well behaved that their probation officer discharged them from the program a few months earlier than the due date. Of Harris, it was remarked that he was a very bright individual who is likely to succeed in life. Klebold was said to be intelligent, but needs to understand that hard work is part of fulfilling a dream. In May 1998, Harris typed a letter of apology to the owner of the van, 
saying he was sorry he did it. Uh, at the same time, he wrote in his journal, why shouldn't we, the gods, with a small case G, have the right to break into a van that some expletive deleted left in the middle of nowhere? The two made a video for a school project that showed them pretending to shoot fake guns and snuffing students in the hallway of their school as hitmen for hire. The video is known for its swearing scenes in which they yelled at the camera and said violent things. They both displayed themes of violence in their creative writing projects for a school of a doom-based tale written by Harris on January the 17th, 1999, just three months and three days before the fatal day. Harris's teacher said, yours is a unique approach and your writing works in a gruesome way, good details and mood setting. Tragically, he or she did not alert the authorities. Hmm. But then again, uh, this was so rare at the time since uh, Columbine, there have been many other school shootings, fatal school shootings in the United States and around the world, including tragically uh, two in my distant native land, Finland, when I was still living there. So in November 2007 and uh, March 2008, if we are talking, yeah, since Columbine. On April the 20th, 1999, while smoking a cigarette at the start of lunch break, Brooks Brown then saw Harris arrive at school. At 11.19 a.m., Brooks heard the first gunshots after he had walked some distance away from the school and he informed the police via a neighbor's cell phone. By that time, Dylan Klebold had already arrived at the school in a sept car and the two boys left two gym bags, each containing a 20-pound or roughly 9-kilogram propane bomb inside the school cafeteria. When these devices failed to detonate, Harris and Klebold armed themselves with guns and launched a shooting attack against their classmates. It still remains the deadliest attack ever perpetrated at an American high school. Harris was responsible for eight of the 13 con uh, confirmed deaths, including that of a teacher, while Klebold was responsible for the remaining five. There were 24 or 25 wounded, most in critical condition. At least one survivor, um, Anne-Marie Hochhalter, has been confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. At 12.02 p.m., Harris and Cleveland returned to the library. This was 20 minutes after their lethal shooting spree had ended, leaving 12 students and one teacher dead, uh, and another 24 students injured. Yeah, 24 or 25, there are conflicting accounts. Ten of their victims had been killed in the library with their bodies strewn about the floor. Harris and Cleveland went to the west windows and opened fire on the police outside. Six minutes later, they walked to the bookshelves near a table where Patrick Ireland lay badly wounded and conscious. Student Lisa Kreutz, injured in the earlier library attack, was also unable to move. At 12.08 p.m., art teacher Patty Nielsen, uh, who was a part-time teacher, usually left the school at lunch break, but at that time uh, she had the library supervision duty um, and therefore had stayed uh, at the school for yeah, at the start of the lunch break, and she usually left, but not that day, uh, who had locked herself inside a break room with student Brian Anderson and library staff overheard Harris and Klebold shout out in unison, one, two, three, followed immediately by the sound of gunfire. Harris had fired his shotgun through the roof of his mouth, damaging his face and blasting off the back of his head. Klebold held himself in the left temple with his TEC-9 semi-automatic handgun, a bullet, bullet slicing through his head. They died instantly. Uh, before even Harris turned 18, Robin Anderson, with whom Klebold attended the prom three days before the shooting, uh, who had already turned 18 and was an old friend of Klebold and knew nothing of these murderous plans, made a straw purchase of two shotguns and high point carbine for the pair. In exchange for her cooperation with the investigation that followed the shooting, no charges were filed against Anderson. After illegally acquiring the weapons, Klebold sawed off his Savage 311.-D uh, uh, 12-gauge double-barrel shotgun, shortening the overall length to approximately 28 inches or 58 centimeters, a fair under the National Firearms Act, while Harris's Savage Springfield 12-gauge pump shotgun was sawed off to around 
26 inches or 66 centimeters. The shooters also possessed a TEC-DC-9 semi-automatic handgun, which had a long history. The manufacturer of the TEC-DC-9 first sold it to Miami-based Navigar Incorporated, or Navigar Incorporated. It was then sold to Zander's Sporting Goods in Baldwin, Illinois, 1994. The gun later was sold uh, to Thornton, Colorado, firearms dealer Larry Russell. In violation of federal law, Russell failed to keep records of the sale, yet he determined that the purchaser of the gun was 21 years of age or older. He was unable to identify the pictures of Klebold Anderson or Harry shown to him by police after the shooting. Two men, Mark Maines and Philip Duran, were convicted of supplying weapons to the two. The bombs used by the pair varied and were crudely made from carbon dioxide canisters, galvanized pipe, and metal propane bottles. The bombs were primed with matches placed at the end, at one end, sorry. Both had striker tips on their sleeves. When they rubbed against the bomb, the match head would light the fuse. The weekend before the shootings, Harris and Boat had purchased propane tanks and other supplies from a hardware store for a few hundred dollars. Several residents of the area claimed to have heard cl- glass breaking and buzzing sounds from the Harris family's garage, which later was concluded to indicate they were constructing pipe bombs. Harris purchased more propane tanks on the morning of the attack. More complex bombs, such as the one that detonated on the corner of South Wadsworth, or Wadsworth Boulevard and Car- Carrill Avenue had timers. The two largest bombs built were found in the street cafeteria and were made from small propane tanks. Only one of these bombs exploded, only partially detonating. It was estimated that if any of the bombs placed in the cafeteria detonated properly, the blast could have caused extensive structural damage to the school and would have resulted in hundreds of casualties. So if people ask, where was God at the time? Well, God, for example, prevented hundreds of people from dying. In the worst case scenario, there could have been several hundred dead and injured people, or even many. <clears throat> there was controversy over whether the perpetrators should be memorialized. Some were opposed to say that it glorified murderers, while others argued that the perpetrators were also victims. Atop a hill near Columbine, high school crosses were erected for Harris and Cleveland, along with those for the people they killed, but the father of Daniel Rorbo the second student to be killed cut them down, saying that murderers should not be memorialized in the same place as victims. Harris and Klebold wrote much about how they would carry out the massacre, but less about why. A journal found in Harris's bedroom contained almost every detail that the boys planned to follow after 5 o'clock a.m. on uh, April the 20th, 1999. In journal entries, the pair often wrote about events such as the Oklahoma City bombing in April 1995, the Waco siege in the spring of 1993, the Vietnam War, and other similar events, including blurbs and notes on how they wished to outdo these events, so causing even more damage. Focusing especially on what Timothy McVeigh did in Oklahoma City, he would be executed, I think, in 2001. They mentioned how they would like to leave a lasting impression on the world with this kind of violence. That the shooters initially planned and failed to blow up the high school and not just shoot students is an indication of how they had wished to overshadow the events that had occurred respectively four and six years earlier. One of Harris's last journal entries essentially blamed uh, many students for uh, shunning him, not involving them in their activities. Dylan Klebold also accused other students of having ignored uh, or bullied them. Nick Tura suggested that the murderers were acting as revolutionaries. Historian David Farber of Temple University wrote that Tura's assertion only makes sense in an academic culture in which, uh, tr- in which transgression is by definition political and in which any rage against society can be considered radical. Harris began keeping a journal in April 1998, so one year before perpetrating the massacre with Klebold. 
Harris wanted to join the United States Marine Corps, but his application was rejected shortly before the shootings because he was taking the drug Fluvoxamin, 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 sorry, an SSRI antidepressant, which he was required to take as part of court-ordered anger management therapy. According to the recruiting officer, Harris did not know about this rejection. According to the autopsy, uh, there were low or low therapeutic or normal, not toxic or lethal blood levels of Luvox or Fluvoxamine in his system at the time of his suicide. In April 2009, so 10 years after the shootings, Professor Aubrey Immelman, who was a PhD um, and at the time uh, was teaching at or researching or both at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, published a book, Columbine, a True Crime Story, A Victim, The Killers, and The Nation's Search for Answers, which includes a personality profile of Eric Harris based on his journal entries and personal communication. Immelman's profile believes the material suggesting behavior patterns consistent with a malignant narcissism, with pathological narcissism, antisocial features, paranoid traits, and unconstrained aggression. The report notes that such a profile should not be construed as a direct psychiatric, psychiatric diagnosis, which is based on face-to-face -face interviews, formal psychological testing, and collection of collateral information. In his journal, Klebold wrote about his view that he and Harris were godlike and more highly evolved than any other human being, but his secret journal records self-loathing and suicidal intentions, so seems to have had contrary feelings, uh, grandiose and self-pitying ones. Page after page was covered in hearts as he was secretly in love with a Columbine student. It was speculated that revenge for the arrest was a possible motive for the attack, but why didn't they then att attack a police station? And that the pair planned on having a massive gun battle with police during the shooting. <clears throat> um. In April 2001, the families of over 30 victims were given shares in a 2,538,000 US dollar settlement by the perpetrators' families, Mark Maines and Philip Duran. The Harrises and Klebolds contributed 1568000 to the settlement from their homeowners' policies. The Maines contributed 720000 and the Durans contributed 250000 The Harrises and the Klebolds were ordered to guarantee an additional $32,000 to be available against any future claims. The Maines were or ordered to hold $80,000 against future claims. The Durans were ordered to hold $50,000. Family had filed a 250 million lawsuit, a 250 million dollar lawsuit against the Harrises and Klebolds in 1999, and did not accept the 2001 settlement terms. A judge ordered the family to accept the 166 thousand dollar settlement in June 2003. In August 2003, the families of five other victims received undisclosed settlements from the Harrises and Klebolds. I think this is it, and I wish all of you a very safe and blessed remainder of July and the summer holiday. Those of you who are on summer holiday, wish you well in your work search, in your return to work, on your return to work, to studying, training, and above all, I wish you God's wonderful and protective blessing and presence.